I'm delighted to be here with Sir John Whitmore, a former British racing driver who drove with the likes of Jim Clark, Jack Sears and Sterling Moss, winning his first race in 1958. When he retired from racing, Sir John went into the psychology of sport and this later transcended into, into business and psychology around that, but really honing into performance and human performance and how we can get the best from ourselves. He's perhaps best known as a pioneer of the coaching industry. He's written five books on coaching and leadership development. Coaching for Performance specifically has sold in excess of three quarters of a million books and has been translated into 17 languages. Sir John is the executive chairman of Performance Consultants International and he has a President's Award from the International Coaching Federation alongside two honorary PhDs. And we're delighted to be with him today. So John, what were your earliest motivations and inspirations? Well, it really came from my, my parents because um, I, I was three years old at the start of World War II and um, my parents were absolutely committed to looking after people who lived in the same area because my mother was head of the Red Cross and my father was head of the uh, military um, advice at that time, so uh, they were working very hard on that. And so I, I thought that the purpose of life was to take care of people because that's what they were doing. And that was a, a very inspirational start because uh, we continued, my sister and I continued taking care of people. It was only later when people started talking about money and things like that, I thought it was, why are they talking about money? Because people is what's important, you know? Oh, absolutely. Mm. That's great. And, and presumably, because it was around the time of the war, it must have been quite hard, but maybe as a child, it was maybe looking back on it. Well, I, it I must say that, um, <laughs> that yeah, I didn't really understand war, and I, there were moments there that were quite exciting, you know? And, uh, but I mean, you know, it was, it was uh, serious too, uh, and because we were in an area uh, very close to Tilbury Docks, which was a very heavily bombed area. Yes. And uh, most of the children in that area were moved up to Yorkshire or, or Scotland uh, to get away from that. But my father decided that my sister and I would need to stay <laughs> near Tilbury Docks. <laughs> and early, early in your career, um, you started racing. You, you won your first race in, in 1958. What, um, what was it that drew you to racing? Do you think? Was it? Well, it was interesting because my father um, was uh, um, seventy uh, was born in 1872, and in those times they only had horses, and so um, he didn't even see a car until he was 28 years old, and uh, so I wanted to achieve something, and I think my father wanted me to ride horses, and uh, I wanted to do something different. And my father had all these horses and taught me to ride and all that sort of thing. And I thought, what can I do that is different? And I thought, a car. My father cannot drive a car. So I will drive a car. And that was my thing that got me into racing. It was nothing to do with I wanted a car, but I wanted to be it's different early to my father. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to do it something that was my achievement, not that I was doing it to copy my father. No, indeed. And am I right in thinking that actually when you won uh, one of the British Touring Car Championships, your father didn't even know that you entered? Yes, I, I won the British Saloon Car Championship. Saloon Car Championship. And, uh, and uh, we deliberately did not tell my father because uh, he being, would have you disapproved. And your mm. Yes, my mother was wonderful. She, she's, my mother was Norwegian and uh, she understood and uh, supported me and didn't tell my father what I was doing. <laughs> so I had actually won the British Saloon Car Championship and my father never knew I was a racing driver. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so a whole career he knew nothing about. Um, there's been a really interesting exhibition of late in London about Steve McQueen and his life and I know he's someone that you knew well. Yeah. And, um, you tell a great story about when you drove up the newly opened M1 with him. I wondered if you could share that funny story. <laughs> well, um, yeah, Steve was, uh, was over here uh, making a, a, a black and white 
uh, wartime film, actually. And, and um, he uh, and I just happened to meet him, and uh, we got talking, and we talked for about two hours and found we had a lot of common interests. And uh, Steve was riding motorcycles. He was a very good motorcyclist and also was interested in cars. So we sort of uh, made friends in, in that way, and that's how that sort of thing um, started. And, uh, and uh, we rode motorcycles together and that sort of thing. So that's how that friendship began. Yes. <laughs> and so, so did it begin when you drove up the, M the M1 with him? I believe you were in a, in a Jaguar. <laughs> were you in a Jaguar? Well, there was one time I was, uh, we were up in, in, in Coventry for some reason. There was one of the factories there, car factories there, there we went to. There and we were coming back, and I had a big uh, estate car at the time, and I was coming back down the M1, and uh, there was a, a, a mini, uh, you know, small car on the side of the M1, and I was going down in my bigger car, going a bit faster, and uh, as we went past this mini, there were two girls in the, the mini. One was driving, one was, the, and uh, Steve said, "Stop." And I said, you can't stop on the M1, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And he said, oh, yes, uh, you, you know, you ran out of fuel or something like that. You can stop. So anyway, I, I stopped the car because he was signaling to me. And uh, what he had done is to wave to the Mini beside us as we were passing to get them to stop. And so we stopped, I stopped the car, and, and they stopped. And uh, I couldn't believe it. He jumped out of my car, took a bag with him, and jumped into the Mini. And he said, you go on. And I drove away, is what he expected. And he stayed in the car with these two girls, and nobody saw him for two days. He just disappeared. And uh, it, was a, it was an amazing story, Funny because story. Uh, I, I don't want to go into more detail no, about no, that No, 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 we don't need to go into more detail. It's a very interesting story, and I'm sure there's lots more stories around Steve McQueen and various other people that you raced with. Um, but moving on from, from your, your racing career and, and obviously that inspiration, um, you, you then did some work with, um, with Tim Galway on the inner game, and I suppose using that whole psychology of, of sport and winning and performance. And, um, can you tell me more about that? Well, I, th I think when you've been in one sport, which I'd been uh, obviously successfully in, and uh, I'd been in one sport, you begin to look at how you could apply this to other sports. So I began to play other games too, you know, to see what I was good at. And I heard about Tim Galway, um, who d did the difference uh, between the, the psychological side and the physical side was the way he saw the difference. And I thought that was very interesting because I think I was interested in the psychological side as well. And so uh, the word coaching was a sort of word that people associated with sport anyway. Yes, absolutely. But we began to use that word in the workplace because mm. we were using the technique. And in fact, when I was uh, running um, some early courses in trying to teach coaching, we used to do about one hour in a sport to get people to understand the physicality that takes part in, in, the, in the game. So we have the psychological and the physical is part of the game as well, not just the technique of doing that particular game, you know? And that was very important, and I think it was a big change in the evolution of, of coaching came really about that time. And is that where you talked about your, your earlier influences around helping people, but do you think where that perhaps passion, if I might call it as such, for, for helping others overcome, I suppose, what you might term very human obstacles, you know, that we put well, up there for ourselves? Yeah, I mean, how that happened was that um, we were interested in the psychology of performance because Tim Galway was talking about, you know, what's inside you and what you do outside with a tennis racket or whatever it is. And so I was looking at the psychology of, of uh, this sort of process, and that's where that really came about. And I, I studied psychology quite extensively Indeed, after that. Yes. We kept the word coaching, 
but uh, we began to apply it increasingly with other things other than uh, sport. In other words, we, we saw that this has value in the workplace. Mm, and the reason for that was simply that some people who came on the courses we ran um, to, to uh, get um, coaching courses, I mean, we ran tennis yes. courses and that sort of thing, and sometimes a business person would sign on because they wanted to come to the tennis or the golf or whatever it was, and they came along to that. And those business people, one or two of them said, why don't you apply this with business? And that's when we began to say, well, we could use this with business. And I then studied more psychology and we could see that business could benefit a lot from coaching. And this was really the beginning of the application of coaching to business. Absolutely. Um, and we'll go back to that in a moment. Um, but just tapping back, I suppose, just momentarily to your time as a as a, a racing driver when I know you had some um, you know, hairy moments and accidents and various yeah. things that occurred. Would you say that, that an element of coaching sometimes is, is about conquering you know, the fear bit, be it the fear of failure or, 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 or fear of success sometimes, is that often something that I think people grapple with? Yeah. Well, it was absolutely true, particularly in the time when I was racing, because a lot of people got killed at that time. Yeah, it, was, it was the most dangerous period of motor racing at mm. that time. And so the, the fear was inevitably there. And what we were all dying to do is to overcome the fear that we had. So we, we, we pushed ourselves and we challenged ourselves and we would do things that were you know, uh, a bit dangerous sometimes because we wanted to learn from that. And that was part of the thing, is overcoming the fear. And um, it's been interesting, pure process. Yeah, for sure. And, and I would imagine part of that fear is it, when that fear is all consuming, it, it does take away one's ability a bit, you know, <laughs> diminishes the clarity, doesn't it? And, and takes that edge away. It has to be there, but it's how we, we manage it, I suppose. I think it is, it is a, exactly what you've said there, is managing ourselves. You have this difficult situation that can be very threatening. You, you might have something will break on the car and that might be threatening or somebody might be overtaking you in a dangerous way or something like that. So there's all these sort of things happening. But we had to keep overcoming the difficulties that happened. Yes. They weren't just the, the disastrous things, they were things that happened on the track. Mm. And so mm. we were challenged all the time to overcome the difficulties. And I found that absolutely fascinating. And I, I wanted to increase the, the, the difficulties sometimes because that challenge was, was very tempting. Yes, oh gosh, absolutely. And, and, and that's part of the, the human psyche, isn't it? You know, doing something that is, that is a bit harder, a bit more difficult, a bit more extreme, yeah. or whatever that might be. I read a, a lovely story ad, a, about um, a moment when you had retired from racing, and obviously you were doing all the work um, with Tim Galway and in psychology and, 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 and the coaching work in business. When you came back to racing, to I believe race a McLaren M8, F, which yeah. is, is a bit of a beast, isn't it? 8.4 litres or something. After my professional period, we could do some of these uh, special events which were racing, where I wasn't racing necessarily to try to win in the same way, but when you are competitive, you, you do anyway. Yes, you know. Actually, yes. So <laughs> I came back and I, I, it was a long time. I mean, mm. I actually retired in 1966 mm. from professional racing. But, uh, but uh, 20 years later than that, I drove the McLaren, yes. for example, and uh, I could still drive. <laughs> <laughs> I could still drive quite well, you know. Yes. And uh, so I had that sort of uh, uh, success at a later time. And actually, um, you know, we were doing quite, uh, I mean, just for general interest, I mean, we were quite fast in those days. For example, I was the first person uh, when we had a car that was capable of 200 miles an hour at Le Mans in the, in, the, in the dark, in the practice, in the first day in the dark, I did 201.6 miles an hour, which hadn't, nobody had done more than 200 miles an hour before. But this was in 1966. And I mean, now you can buy a car that does nearly that speed. But uh, in those days, it was quite interesting. <laughs> and therefore, I think what I've done in my life is always be competitive like that. 
And, sure, and, that's coming and, through very clearly. And, and <laughs> so it, it, but it, it became, instead of being uh, competitive to prove to my father that I was okay, it became a game and it was fun. It's interesting you mentioned the word fun then, because I know, I know when um, you know, you've talked about coaching or, or you know, been at conferences talking about um, you know, your books and, and the great work that you've done, sometimes it's, a, it's around bringing the fun back in. So people are still learning and yeah. they're still growing and they might well be doing incredibly complex things. Yeah. But actually if the fun bit's in there, you know, the success often is, is more likely to come with it. It's very, very important. It's, uh, it's very interesting that, that question you're asking because sometimes when you have to say things that might be difficult, for example, in the business world, mm -hmm. you have to say things and you have to get people's attention to something that they may not have already have in their business world because you can see that that person has a weakness in some way. And therefore, what I found was is it's not a good idea to turn to people and say, well, you did that wrong or you don't know how to do that very well. I would have a, a, a sort of thing that I would say, well, what if you could do that? What would it be like? And so there are ways of doing it. When you say, what if, it doesn't mean you're saying, I expect you to do it, mm. but think about it. And that's this human thing that's very, very important. I think humans have a lot of brains and we don't use nearly as much as we have. And by, by asking those sort of questions, what if, you get people to take their thinking a little bit beyond where it is. And that, I think, is a very important part of coaching. Mm. But unfortunately, some people in the coach training don't realize or don't have enough of the psychology understanding to understand that. But I mean, that's growing. I mean, the coaching profession is getting better and better all the time. And it's not perfect and nothing is. But, you know, there we are. And, and is, is the, perhaps the, the wider thinking and enabling people to tack or tap into if you like their wider thinking do you think that's something that perhaps business leaders particularly ha perhaps having come through a, a, a difficult time economically need to be thinking more about thinking so. deeper and i think a lot of people when the world is in a hurry um, a lot of people don't think deeply enough and the capacity is there a lot of people would say we care about the planet and communities and other people in a bigger sense, but actually in your day-to-day -day world, it's difficult to look at that and think, well, you know, how do I connect with that? So, so I suppose, how, how do you think, what's the, what's the tiny step that maybe people or individuals need to start doing in order to, to start that shift? Because I think there is a shift towards it, yeah. i.e. the more people-centred things and being very aware of others and communities mm. and that whole bit about being human. But obviously it's, it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. People are getting more whole system in the way they think now and they are more able to pick up some of the problems that we are facing. But on the other hand, things are changing quicker. I really feel this is a very important part of education we could educate people to think bigger when they're already in school. We have to modernize our own thinking mm. to keep pace with the changing world. Yeah. You're obviously very driven. You know, we've picked up the piece around your competition and those things that you strive to do, a bit of rebellion there, a bit of doing things differently, but wanting to shake things up yeah. and do things differently. You know, someone's sitting, I don't know, watching this thinking, I want to do something different or I want to do something different in my life or I want to get fit or, you know, or be a CEO of, of my own company or whatever it might be. What would you say it is the first step for them? What do they need to do? What, you know, what questions do they need to, you know, what's that well, little... It's, it's a very interesting thought there because, um, I mean, I go back to, to racing. When I was racing, there was, there was certain things that people tended to do as a racing driver or other more experienced racing drivers would give you the advice to do that. Yeah. But I didn't like that advice. I used to do things my own way. Mm. And my own way was not that it was particularly clever, it was just it felt better to do it that way. And, and so the result of that was I would sometimes do something that other drivers would not be doing 
And part of my success was when I did things that other people didn't do. I mean, I talked about 200 miles an hour at, at, at uh, Le Mans. It was only because I didn't believe the limitation that says you can't do that. I think it's very important to be able to encourage what can you do? What would you like to try to do? What might you be able to do? Or you run this fast now. What happens if you were able to run faster? What would you do then? And that's something... Like Roger, Roger Bannister with the four minute mile. It was the same yes. thing, wasn't it? People told it, it Absolutely. was, it was it's, not it's, possible it's, and then it happened. The, and... The, uh, it, there were wonderful examples mm. of, of, of these uh, different ways of, of doing things. And, and the great one was the, the, the high jump. The high jump was always done in a certain way, like you did a scissors jump. And then uh, this guy came along who did it backwards. Completely, completely differently, yeah. And completely. he was only 18 years old when he did it backwards at the university. And one, the, 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 well, some athletes saw him doing it. And they said, I'll teach you to jump properly, and then you'll be do very good because you've got springy feet. And he said, OK, you can teach me. But in the end, he was still faster, he was still better the way he was doing it. Now the whole world has changed the way they jump just because this student, 18 years old, did it in a different way. Now, if we could learn from that, that, that there is always other things that you could do that's better. And, and so I, I suppose it, it, you know, it's that whole premise around doing things your own way. Yeah. But, you know, be it the guy doing the high jump or you know, you, the racing or the, yeah. um, and, and You've got and to running. do it your and way. And if you do it your own way, yeah. well, you then have Well, every human being is different. Absolutely. We are mm -hmm. not the same, and the, the trouble is when we, when we organize people to do things, we tend to get them to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. We've got to allow people to do it their particular way, and this, uh, the different ones, the high jump and, the, uh, and that sort of thing, was and different ways things. of doing things, and yeah. I drove cars in different ways, and it was successful. You've obviously done things your way. <laughs> you know, there's the patterns through, like, which is great, uh, very inspirational. Um, and what, um, what do you want to be known for? Because there's you know, so many things you know, that, that you've done and you've achieved and, and, and helped other people, businesses achieve. Well, it's, it's strange because I, I don't want to be known for anything. It's really strange because I've never, when, when, I, when I go to speak at conferences and that sort of thing, when people clap at the end, I want to hide. <laughs> it's not important for me to, to be recognized, I want to, uh, you know, do things that are taking it to the next step, but I don't want to, I'm not looking for self-importance in that, and I'm really not interested, which is why I didn't go into Formula One or any of those things, it just wasn't interesting. My interest is in what I can do, and so if you had a purpose in this life, if you had a purpose for being on planet Earth, what would you think your particular purpose would be? And what people say time and time again is, I want to contribute, and that is together. That is bringing it together again. So the contribution that you see in charity and the contribution when people work together to do something is the future of mankind. That's where we are going, that's where we have to go, and we are moving there. We are slow, we need to move faster, but we are moving there. I think that's wonderful, and that, you know, that last message of, I think about you know, our purpose, you know, what drives yeah. us, you know, that, yeah. that heartfelt thing, that, that if, if we tap into that, many, many things are yeah. possible. But thank you so much for telling your fascinating story of your life and how it's got you to here, and, you know, and, the, and the things you're involved in at the moment. It's brilliant, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you for asking very nice questions. <laughs>